Hello and welcome. And on behalf of the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center, thank you for joining us for the webinar, Breakthrough Cancer Research, Unlocking Power of T-Cells. My name is Ashley Law, and I am a member of the Feinberg Development and Alumni Relations team. Today's event will begin with a presentation by Dr. Jay Choi, a physician scientist at Northwestern. He holds the Jack W. Graffin Professorship and is an Associate Professor of Dermatology as well as biochemistry and molecular genetics. Dr. Choi's clinical and scientific focus is cutaneous lymphoma and his findings have inspired numerous clinical trials and have been recognized by national and international awards. Following the presentation, there will be a Q&A moderated by Dr. Joshua Leonard, Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering at Northwestern. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Choi. Dr. Choi, over to you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm gonna share, uh, um... PowerPoint that I put together. Okay. So uh, welcome everyone. I'm just gonna do a little bit of a slideshow to introduce myself, our lab, and talk a little bit about our uh, research. And so I'll just gonna get started. And first I always think about this uh, picture. It was taken actually uh, by my daughter on a Saturday in Chicago, and I went to go see my patient here who gave permission for this uh, a few years ago. And I remember um, just very vividly that we had a very close relationship. And uh, I have to say, I'm really sad to say that he didn't uh, make it all the way through, but it's actually around this time I promised him that we'll do all we can to actually um, try to improve therapies for the future and in particular for future patients like him. So our goal is actually very simple. Our goal is to um, cure cancer and we're gonna use whatever means we can to do it. So I just wanna introduce myself. And I first wanted to say is that I actually um, was uh, born in Korea, came over here when I was very young and actually spent most of my um, childhood and um, through my high school days in South Jersey, in, uh, in New Jersey. And um, one thing I'll say is that being an immigrant is actually an incredibly um, unique experience. And I just wanna say is that in general, um, like many immigrants uh, who come to this country, I, I just remember growing up thinking that, you know, America is a wonderful opportunity and place that you can make a difference and an impact. And it's just something that has been uh, really enforced upon me by my um, parents to really think broader about how we can make an impact on society that goes beyond ourselves. And it's been a really driving, um, you know, idea would really inspire the things that we do in our life. So from there, I actually went to Harvard where I majored in biochemistry. And I just wanted to share one anecdote. I remember um, the exact moment I decided I wanted to do biomedical research for a career. Uh, it turns out I was doing an experiment. It was very late at night. It was past 12 o'clock, maybe like one o'clock. And I was trying to finish up this experiment. <clears throat> and then the fire alarm went off. And I remember this very vividly because I was thinking since so it's 1 a.m. that there's absolutely no chance that this could be a, um, a drill. At the same time, I was thinking was that I'm almost done this incredibly important experiment that was the culmination of about two years of work. And I remember thinking, that I just wanna know the answer, uh, not worry about a grade or worry about anything like that. I just wanna know the answer. And so I stayed for another 10, 15 minutes, but the fire alarm wouldn't go off. And so at some point I decided, you know, I'm gonna leave because I thought there might not be a death worse than death in the lab with a pipette in hand. But it actually showed me just like how much I was just really invested in thinking about the science and thinking about discovery and thinking about how we could potentially improve human health through research. And so uh, using that as sort of an inspirational experience for me personally, I ended up um, going to Yale Med where I uh, did an MD PhD, where my goal was really to learn both um, basic investigative rigorous science but also to be able to learn cutting edge medicines, so be able to provide elite patient care to patients. But, you know, we can only see so many patients in our lifetime. And it's really through the promise of research that our goal is that we can basically improve clinical care for patients um, that go beyond the ones we can see in clinic. And so from there, I came to Northwestern. Now it seems like about like eight years ago, and the goal really was to um, start something new. I really embraced the mission of uh, the Dean and the um, Cancer Center Director, which is really to improve 
the way that we treat patients, try to identify new ways that we can treat patients and try to think about new ways we can possibly cure patients. And that's really been a driving you know, principle of our lab and really imbues the, um, um, the culture of the lab and what we do. And our goal is really to take on these very important human problems. And I just wanna end by saying that I am a co-founder as well as currently a board member of this company called Moonlight Bio. And the reason is, is some of the technology I'm gonna show you, we're actually hoping we'll get into people. And so that can't easily happen entirely in the lab or in a university, but to be able to make something that could be um, administered in India or Indiana, it really requires a corporate entity like Moonlight Bio to sort of take it forward. So just wanna say, what does our lab do? And, and I'll, I'll kind of make it just a big picture. Our goal is to really take people who have been given a textbook diagnosis of disease. And I show that in the people here with the people in gray. And I just wanna say is that um, our goal is to really identify what makes each person different. And in this case, we're really trying to find out what makes a blue person or a green person different. And the idea is that if we can fundamentally understand the molecules and cells that make each person different, that this will really provide us the unique opportunity to design cures that would be specifically tailored to each of these people. And so we've really spent the last eight years spending a lot of time trying to identify the colors that make patients different, patients with different cancers, patients with different inflammatory diseases. But now our lab is really transitioning to try to understand how do we generate new therapies to be able to treat these patients that we're seeing in, um, in, the, in the clinic? And so before I go forward, I just really want to say is I always highlight the people who do all the work. And this is my lab now. It's a really great um, looking group of people. Uh, but I really want to emphasize one person in particular, Jay Daniels, who is really the inspiration of a lot of this work. And it kind of gets back to the original um, thesis of my presentation, which is not about the science but it's about the people and the approach. Jay is a um, local Illinoisan who joined my lab a few years ago now. And I just remember to this day, it was total serendipity how it came over. It actually turned out that um, I gave my first lecture at the medical school the day after the Cubs won the World Series and broke their 100 plus year curse. The, uh, there was no one in the audience except for the one person who was paid to be the paid scribe for the entire medical school class and three of her best friends, which included Jay. He ended up joining my lab and did an amazing job in a very short period of time. And I somehow convinced him to apply for the MD PhD program because it was just clear that his route was to become a physician scientist, uh, probably better than me in the future. And I just remember to this day, a very vivid example where when he applied, the director of admissions called me and he said, you know, we love Jay. He's all the grades, all the experience we need to get in. But we're actually worried that he might be um, he might be too optimistic about the road ahead and not truly appreciate all the um, potential obstacles it takes to become a physician scientist. And I, I remember telling um, this person it back is that if if we are going to reject students or applicants because they're too optimistic, then where are we? And I think his deep sense of optimism that science can help solve these big problems really is part of the whole project we have going forward. So. With that, I'm gonna switch gears and really go to the project itself. And I wanted to say is what we've been looking at is that there's these um, really unique opportunities for these cellular therapies where you can genetically manipulate uh, cells in the blood, give them back to people. And they've had this amazing success in a particular set of cancers called blood cancers. And you can see here, this is the survival curve is flat it's because these patients are cured of these incredibly, um, otherwise devastating, tragic diseases. And it turns out there can be no better example than one of the first patients. Uh, her name is Emily Whitehead. She was a child when she was first treated for this B-cell leukemia. And you can see that she's essentially been cured of this disease 10 years out. And what's really remarkable is I think that this past year was her first year at Penn where she was treated for this devastating disease and has been cured of this devastating disease with this engineered um, T cell product. But it turns out if you look at other cancers, and in this case, we're looking at solid tumors, which include many of the cancers you're well familiar with, including brain, skin, pancreatic, gut, lung, breast, colon. 
that actually in these cases, those kind of therapies have not done as well. And that, you know, if you look and compare between the two, there's a clear difference between a plateau where everyone's cured and a strategy where basically no one is really cured of this disease with this kind of approach. And so there's a lot of um, science behind this, but we and others have really essentially found is that normal T cells are just not strong enough to be able to overcome the defenses of a solid tumor. And so um, a lot of people are working on this problem, but we took what we thought was a relatively unique approach. What we tried to do was say, in my other life, as Ashley had said, we study a lot of these T cell lymphomas. And in these T cell lymphomas, what we have been finding is that there are uh, genetic mechanisms by which these T cells evolve to be fitter and stronger. These are these red mutations as you see here. And so uh, over time, there's a constant evolution by which these cells are being um, compared against one another and only the fittest survive kind of through natural evolution. And so uh, what turns out is that it may put a different way is that you have all of these T cells, these immune cells in your body that could possibly fight cancer or bacteria and a very small subset of them develop these new mutations, which enable them to be super strong. And so we thought that we could potentially borrow this superpower from these lymphoma cells and apply them to T cell engineering. And so what I will show is that essentially what we think we have is an opportunity to take a normal T cell and make it uh, a superhuman T cell. And this is the kind of approach that we're thinking about. Our idea is that we can take a normal T cell and make it a super T cell by borrowing the superpowers that make lymphoma cells strong and utilize this product, which includes the potency enhancements that we are putting in with synthetic receptors to recognize and potentially kill cancers. By marrying these technologies, we're gonna be able to hopefully kill uh, cancer. Uh, and more broadly and do better than the previous technologies. And so there's two uh, major advantages of our approach. First is that, you know, a lot of people, when they think about something, what they really start with is a, a concept in their mind. And then they have to try it in the lab and then hopefully it works in some kind of mouse model, if you can believe it. And only then if it works in the mouse model, does it actually end up going possibly into humans. But what we've done is kind of flip that strategy on its head. What we have taken is we've taken a strategy that nature already uses to make super powerful T cells from humans and applied that to try to fight a human disease or other cancers. And so I think this is a very important flipping of the switch where we can really utilize um, human data to understand what makes human T cells strong right off the bat. The second thing is that, you know, um, in a lot of cases, uh, this could be seen when you have, uh, for example, um, you know, moths that turn color with industrial evolution, and then only the dark moths survive because there's so much soot on the trees. And when the climate improves, only the light moths survive because there's no longer any soot, so they can't really hide from they can so they can hide from the birds. But the idea here is that you know, if you think a uh, uh, postdoc's lifespan is about five years in the lab or a PhD is about five years. And it turns out in people, you can sort of see these <laughs> years upon years by which these T cells become stronger and stronger through these incredible screens by which there's these incredible number of mutations that can make things very different from one another. And these combine to create these super strong fit T cells over decades. <laughs> Excuse me. So, I'll only show one real data slide here, which is just to say that we applied this technology and found that it was really incredibly uh, useful. I remember this day very vividly. <clears throat> it turns out it was uh, December 22nd or December 23rd. And my student Jay had sort of stayed behind to do this one last experiment. And I remember he called me and said, um, just was so excited that this strategy had worked. And I'll, I'll basically show just one data slide to show the message. But the idea is that we have these animals, this is an animal model, preclinical model, where it's very difficult to treat because we don't do any of the things that are necessary to make it easier. In humans, they receive uh, chemotherapy to 
uh, deplete you of T cells so that you have quote unquote more space to be able to implant more T cells. But we didn't do that. And it turns out even without that, a very small number, 20,000 cells were able to clear these um, you know, melanomas from these uh, mouse models. And this is really strikingly such a small number when you compare the fact that in humans, you need hundreds of millions of cells to billions of cells to make the same difference. We've now followed this over incredibly long periods of time and these responses have been incredibly durable and highly potent, suggesting that we really have something here that's very powerful and useful for patients. So just wanna say is, you know, where do we go from here? I took this picture from an incredibly kind um, commentary from Nick Verstifo, one of the godfathers of cellular therapy. He uh, made this incredible analogy, which I don't tend to believe, but um, but he basically said that there's sometimes in medicine where something goes awry and something that's potentially bad can become incredibly useful and incredibly good. He made the analogy that when fungus got on the plates of bacteria, it led to the discovery of penicillin. When HIV came and unfortunately brought with it AIDS, the same viral vectors have led to new abilities to do genetic engineering and cure genetic diseases. And his thought is maybe that by learning from these T cell cancers, we can truly unlock how to make T cells stronger so that we can actually finally treat these diseases. So in general, um, where do we go from here? Our goal is really to translate this because our goal is to cure cancer. So there are these therapies that we talked about of chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy. You take cells from patients, you genetically engineer them and reinfuse them to be able to um, go target cancer cells in the body. And the reason why this is um, such an important potential unlocking of the potential is that it turns out that we're hoping that now, instead of just focusing on blood cancers, which represent somewhere between five and 10% of adult cancers, we can now target the huge swath of solid tumors that include brain, uh, thyroid, breast, lung, pancreas, prostate, and colon, and that we can try to cure these otherwise um, potentially uh, fatal diseases or aggressive diseases for patients. And so what we're thinking about here is that what we'd like to try to consider is that many times in academics, um, we're measured by our uh, publications and our grant funding. But I wonder if we should really think about reframing the definition of success. And our goal should really be to think about not only scientific progress, but can we actually develop things that will become drugs so that they can be utilized for patients in at the university as well as abroad. And our goal here is that there is kind of a blueprint by which we can um, marry these technologies and potentially do first in human trials at Northwestern. So uh, bigger picture, I just wanna show a little bit about, you know, how you can think about this even more abstractly. What I just wanna say is that we have many talented colleagues who really study biology from a reductionist perspective, looking at yeast, bacteria, frogs, and worms. But I wanna say is that, um, you know, what we have learned is that you, you learn an incredible amount from your patients and from human patients. And this has really been the inspiration for almost all the biology that we're doing, as well as what we think is uh, for us, our, our leading edge advantage to be able to deploy this uh, for good. And so what we do is in general, is we take patients, we take their tumors, for example, we try to extract them. We do incredible single cell based analyses, apply machine learning, really try to identify new targets and try to do clinical trials. This is kind of the um, uh, approach that we're generally taking and one of the ways that this wheel has turned is potentially for uh, T cell therapies for uh, aggressive cancers. But we've now learned that we can utilize this across the board for many things. I'll just say is that we've applied um, the same lessons and technologies to use these T cells to better understand how they can be used against other cancers, how to fight T cell cancers themselves. And we recently have this idea that we can actually utilize this 
to um, treat autoimmune disease by being able to understand the circuitry of T cells and figuring out ways to alter them for, uh, for patient benefit. So with that, I think I'm at my, um, close to my uh, 20 minute mark, but I just wanna really say is really wanna highlight is, just wanna thank you all for joining for this talk. Um, a lot of the work here uh, was done by Jay Daniels, as you see here. He's been one of my first MD PhD student, a real beacon of hope, optimism, and he knows that um, with science, we can really overcome many of the ailments that currently um, afflict our populations of patients. This is my group. Um, I just remember this very early on because it's really inspiring to see so many of the trainees go on to continue their um, own desire to fight disease through research and, and clinical work. There's a number of, of important um, foundations that have funded us in particular, uh, the Bakewell Foundation and the Mark Foundation have really uh, both thought that cancer is a solvable problem, potentially through engineering. And I just want to say it's a really close thanks to uh, Cole Roybal from UCSF, who's a very close colleague and collaborator and really an equal contributor to a lot of the work that I have just shown. And so with that, I'll just say is that um, um, the one person who I, I don't thank enough is uh, my wife, my family. I'll just say is that uh, my wife says I never thank her enough. And so I just would say is I also want to say thanks to my wife and my really three beautiful kids. And I also like to end with this because this turns out to be um, the place in Hawaii where Jurassic Park was filmed. And so it makes me just think about the intersection of evolution, biotechnology, and really unlocking what was once thought to be impossible and making it possible. So thank you. So... With that, I just want to say is I want to introduce our moderator, who's my uh, great friend and colleague, uh, Josh Leonard. He's incredibly um, uh, been a leader in the ability of thinking about how to um, target um, different T cells as well and different environments, including cancer, and has really thought about how to um, be able to drug the undruggable through synthetic biology. He's a professor of chemical and biomedical engineering. I learned so much from Josh all the time. And so when someone asked me who should be the moderator, I thought of him first because he's one of the smartest people I know. So thanks, Josh, for agreeing to do this. Well, thank you, Jay, for the kind introduction and the fantastic seminar. It's a real pleasure to, to join everybody here today. And it's a real pleasure to host this discussion of your incredible work, Jay. Uh, I guess I'll just start by saying that a uh, point of shared interest here, all people who do technology development love, especially the first half of Jurassic Park. I would say <laughs> that was a great. That was a great yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I wanted to maybe uh, ask a few questions on some notes that you alluded to over the course of your presentation. So if, if you don't mind, maybe I'll just kick off a kind of sequence here. So you mentioned with uh, Emily Whitehead's story early on here how this was cl clearly curative for her and for others. I was wondering if you could elaborate on why for, for many patients, immunotherapy is the best or at some point the only option of treatment available. So it turns out um, cancer is a very tough enemy, you know, and um, it constantly tries to survive at all costs. And so if you give it one treatment, it'll actually try to change itself to become um, resistant to that treatment. And so this constant battle between treatments and cancer is happening all the time. Now, the only thing that we know that is equally complex enough that it can take on cancer is the immune system, just like it does for COVID and other bacteria and fungi. The immune system's always in a constant battle with things that's trying to fight with these called pathogens or bacteria. So it turns out we think that it's very likely that the immune system will potentially have the tools with the right therapeutics to be able to match cancer's ability to like change itself and sort of win this arms race. So I think that's really critical. It makes a ton of sense. Um, the other uh question that occurred to me is you, you started off the story, or at least the story with, with uh, immunotherapy, talking about uh, its utility for these kind of blood cell derived cancers. And I was wondering if we could just double click on that a little bit here and think about, you know, how, how hard is it? And like, what are the real barriers to extending that from a cancer where it works really well to all the other cancers? And in particular, the, the very prevalent uh, solid tumors that are a major treatment um, need. That's a really great question. So I think that what we uh, know is that um, 
we just know this from the uh, clinical data. So first of all, I'll say is that we can think of any different molecular biological explanation, but really the major driver of this is the clinical data. So if you gave Emily Whitehead this treatment, you know, over 10 years ago, I think it's a dozen years now, those treatments engrafted in her, they stayed around, you can still find them. And in the chance her cancer pops up, it seems like they're killing them again. So they really think this is a cure. Now, in so many patients who are treated with solid tumors, it turns out you infuse the therapies and then within two to four weeks, it's pretty much gone from the patient. It just is totally lost as far as anyone can tell. And I think the idea here is that when it goes into the tumor to try to, off, to fight off these breast cancers, stomach cancers, prostate cancers, they just face this really harsh tumor microenvironment and are basically forced to disappear. And this is a problem that we haven't fully solved yet. Hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I was thinking about it through the lens of sort of the the angle you're taking uh, with, with the technology, especially you focused on today, right? The idea that there are these natural instances of cellular behaviors that can, can potentially mitigate some of those um, uh, limitations, right? Yeah, so it turns out it's really um, a blessing and curse. I studied this disease called skin lymphomas that afflicts a very small number of people. Uh, but it turns out it's incredibly, it was incredibly useful in to actually study this. It, even though it's a T cell lymphoma, it actually occurs in the skin. So you can think of it as a solid tissue. And in the skin, it faces the same challenges like low oxygen and also very thick fibrous stroma as um, other solid tumors and also affects, also afflicts like these uh, molecules like TGF beta and other things that are really tried to design to sort of shut down T cells. So uh, in the sort of happenstance, what we've been studying all along is how to make T cells stronger in these microenvironments. We just have to port that technology into the adoptive T cell therapies. And so it was an incredible bit of serendipity there. Great. Maybe that's a great next uh, next line of investigation. So you you made mention about how this is uh, something that has been promising, not just at the academic scale, but that there is obviously a next step in the story here. And you know, I think was mentioned in the introduction or in your early remarks here that you and Cole and others took that big extra step to actually get this out to the commercial stage here through Moonlight. And I was wondering if either through Moonlight or in general, what's going on? Uh, could you give us an estimation? about when roughly you think we might see those, those first in human trials, either at Northwestern or sort of in a large sense of, of testing the prospect of these exciting technologies. Yeah, so you know it takes a lot of time to make sure, to take something from the concept to get it into a patient, into clinic. But I'll say is that time is getting shorter and shorter, if you, especially if you have incredible people and talent who are able to sort of shepherd this project along. Um, I think at the company level, we're really optimistic within a year or so, we're really trying to get everything lined up to do a first in human trial. Um, but at the same time, I will say is that, you know, um, companies will solve a lot of problems. They're the ones who are really gonna be able to make a reproducible product that can be given in New York or in Japan. But, you know, academic um, labs are also incredibly, um, actually much more nimble in some ways to, to be able to do some of these trials. What I'll just say is the first trial for Emily Whitehead was done totally in an academic setting with research that actually came through philanthropy and a few foundation research from the investigators at UPenn to end up being um, into given to Emily Whitehead. And, you know, I think that kind of um, sort of risk taking, but also the ability to address, you know, important devastating diseases, um, you know, that flexibility can also occur at the academic setting. It's something we're very interested in trying to do. That's great. Um, maybe I'll ask you a sort of, Backward looking question, and then maybe uh, some crystal ball questions kind of as we get towards the uh, towards the end of our time here. So the backward question was, uh, besides the fundamental insight that I think you mentioned here, you, you mentioned a few types of data that were instrumental for, for figuring out how to take that, that uh, idea that maybe these natural cancers could be useful in coming up with a way to, to implement that in a, in a therapeutic or candidate therapeutic way. Can you help us to understand the role that engineering tools, engineering thinking, maybe even emerging methodologies for, for analytics like artificial intelligence. Can you give us a sense of how those play a role either in the specific work you did or in, in general, this idea of thinking about how to use patient data um, to, to help benefit patients? 
That's a really great question. So I'll, I'll answer it two ways. So first is that we absolutely use um, artificial intelligence, computational biology, and machine learning to be able to understand. You know, it turns out, as you can imagine, for almost everything we do nowadays, the more data you have, the better. And so um, you just need incredibly complex tools, computational tools to address these. And so we routinely use uh, machine learning type approaches to be able to identify you know, um, how these T cells have become stronger and then also uh, mechanistically be able to sort of understand the circuitry of how one thing leads to another to lead to another with these incredibly big data sets. I'll say our lab has routinely over 200 terabytes of data that we're going through all the time. And that includes just what we're working on actively, but also we have many, many, many terabytes that are in um, sort of storage. But I'll say a uh, big picture. I think that um, engineering and biology and sometimes it's controversial. You talk to some people and they really love the days when you have a hypothesis and then you try to uh, answer the hypothesis. And that's very important for biology, of course. But I will say that there has to come an inflection point with every scientific field where it has to become an engineering problem so that you can sort of use this to discover new um, molecules and new cells for good. And so the example I'll give is, of course, in like, you know, semiconductors, the work that was done for decades was incredibly fundamental and had to be done at the university and potentially only at the government settings. But there becomes an inflection point where you're going to be thinking, I'm going to do a semiconductor, or I'm going to make a chip, and this has got to make an impact in normal people's lives, whether that be for a smartphone or for machine learning. You know, you basically take this fundamental discipline that was completely scientific and you make it an engineering problem. You know, the same thing could be said for IT, computer, computer software. I think it's very difficult to imagine. No one would imagine you have a computer science, you know, professor who is not thinking about something that could possibly, hopefully, change the world. And I think we're actually getting to that point with biology as well, as you well know, Josh, through your work, is that, you know, because we've learned so much about how biology works and we have these incredible tools now that enable us to make robust findings, there are select cases and more and more these days where you can take a problem that was a purely scientific problem and actually make an engineering problem. And the reason to do that, of course, is because you want to engineer a new solution to help patients. And so I think the idea is that if we can biologically understand the system enough and get to a certain inflection point, then now you're going to be able to engineer new solutions. And I think we're pretty close to that. And I think people who are going to be at the cutting edge and want to think about therapeutics should think about things from an engineering perspective, not just from a biological perspective, because there's going to be a point of diminishing returns for just pure biology without the hope that it actually can translate to something that benefit patient care. And I think engineering is the key intermediate between those two things. So. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I really like the way you frame that right there. I think you and I have talked about this before, about how the engineering and mindset and the, and the medical mindset have a lot of things in common. I was imagining you sort of, if you talk about trying to make understanding the goal, you have hypothesis-driven research to drive understanding. And, and both engineering and medical innovation are hypothesis-driven research with an application or an outcome in mind, right? Um, maybe- but I, think, I'll, but I think it's important because um, I think what happened, what I understand is, when the, the war on cancer occurred many years ago, there was a question, do we engineer just new therapies or do we have to understand the biology of cancer? Hmm. When that happened in the 60s, I think the answer was probably chosen wisely, let's understand cancer better. And then, but now we understand cancer way better than we do back then. And so I think we now do have the opportunity to say, is the best way just knowing more and more about the cancer or do we need to take these shots on goal of trying to engineer new solutions, you know? Talking to you has always informed me of the value of that tension in the sense that a lot of times as a technology developer, maybe divorced from clinical practice, your goal is in the couple of years time frame, you're trying to think about what's going to work. And if you're practicing medicine, you have people that need help today, right? And so there's just a different balancing of those, I think, ways of taking those forward. That's great. Maybe, maybe can I just jump on that for, for the for the next question here? So sure. um, I think we talked a lot about the applications towards um, some cancers of what you've seen so far. If this is getting into crystal ball territory, I'll acknowledge, but do you have any uh, guesses at the moment as to how the, like say, applicability of some of these approaches might might work. You mentioned it in your slide. I think you mentioned some of the groups you're you're talking with on this in different applications. I'm just curious as far as like what we know today, are there 
you know, cancers, hundreds of different diseases? Are there likely to be some technologies like this that can span at least a large subset of those diseases? Yeah, I really think this is uh, very important because I think that ultimately, um, you know, or, or, um, I see patients, most of my patients I see have um, uncommon cancers. I'll just say it that way. And I, it would be remiss for me to not really emphasize the fact that we really want to treat and cure these patients that I see. I mean, I just have a personal connection to them and it's really important. Um, but, you know, I, it's just like we're, I'm a normal person. You know, my mother in law died of pancreatic cancer. You know, just like anyone else, we're afflicted through our personal lives with so many devastating cases of, of way cancer or other diseases afflict us. So we are, we're always thinking is how do we make the biggest impact possible? You know, and so um, I can't say this will work for everything. We, you know, until we go into patients, we'll, we'll see whether it can work and who it would work for. But our goal is really that we do want to think of near um, solutions that can address the bigger problem that we can affect all the thousands of patients with these much more common cancers like lung cancer and colorectal cancer. And our goal is really to be able to um, help people like that if we can. You know, the other thing I just want to say is that, um, you know, um, even though we said we're taking an engineering approach, we're not going to fit a square peg into a round hole. Our goal is to really get this to work. And so we will really try to figure out which cancer to work for. But I think also once you make a beachhead kind of saying like, we know this works, it makes it easier to sort of figure out how to build from that. And if you're building from nothing. And so the, our goal is also to think, can we make custom solutions for these other cancers and stuff? And then the last point, which I think you were getting at, which is also sort of related to this, is that I think um, we've learned so much about these cells, these T cells, these cells in the blood. It turns out um, cancer specifically tries to effectively poison them or weaken them so that they can survive because the T cells can clear the cancers. But these T cells are also at the root of so many other problems. You know, it's just clear they're part of autoimmune disease and many other sort of aging related disorders. And so um, we do think that some of the stuff we're doing can be more broadly applicable. So we are thinking about how we can um, sort of affect T cell biology and autoimmune diseases and other disease settings. And I think we just have a really um, nice set of tools and taking the same engineering mindset can be very useful there as well. It makes sense. Maybe uh, I'll ask a follow up on that one too. So, so kind of again thinking about maybe a step out and putting the the innovation you told us about from your group in the context of the other things. I oftentimes think about the the field of immunotherapy as we're sort of pushing on the envelope on multiple fronts, right? And so the sort of cellular function and survival. You mentioned very much how that technology can be mentioned here, and there are other aspects that have to do with the the payload itself, the the genes that might be in there, the use of these agents in combination with other interventions here. And I'm wondering if you could give us just kind of a status quo as you see it as where the, you know, where it's moving really quickly, maybe where there's something that's proven or calcitrant and there's there's need for that to become the next uh, piece to move. What are your thoughts on the, the big picture of where immunotherapy is going in the context? I think things are moving very fast. I think that um, it's incredible at how things have changed so quickly. And I think, um, you know, it's like, you sort of sometimes lose the fact of how fast things are moving because you're so close to it. But I'll say a big picture is I do think um, the future is going to be engineered solutions that really can be used and customized to individual patients to fully cure their cancers through immunotherapy with almost no side effects. And I think the approach that you take and the ones that we think about are, you know, um, what's so refreshing about an engineering mindset as opposed to just a pure biological mindset is Let's say we think this thing works like 80%. An engineer will think is how do we get the 80% to 100%? And then if we think, hey, this has this side effect, then we can think as engineers, like how do we get that side effect? How do we remove that side effect? And this just constant pressure to be able to think about, we have optimism that science can engineer new solutions to um, not only the problems we have now, but to the remaining problems with technological innovation. I think this will constantly happen and we'll just get closer and closer to really safe, effective uh, therapies that'll be cures so that makes sense and i guess i'm thinking about in terms of from a practitioner standpoint how much of a challenge it, it, my understanding from talking to other uh, clinicians is that the the scope of the challenge or the nature of the challenges has shifted in some ways in that we've gone from sort of a lack of 
uh, ways of intervening to now the challenge being there are just many, many, many different combinations and strategies where it's actually not clear how to best use even the tools we have. Maybe so in combination with new tools, understanding how to best figure out how to the, use the tools we have. What What's your overall perspective on sort of how those two how those two things play together. Obviously we want better interventions and then there are more interventions to choose from. How does one from, from maybe a clinical standpoint even think about how to, to navigate that? I think we just need to keep upping the science. You know, like I think when science is vague, then the clinical design, trial design will be vague. I think the implementation of the tools will be vague. The idea of whether we can, you know, do A or B and the decisions that are sort of hard to do now will be vague. I think what we really need is just um, I know this sounds, you know, just sort of repetitive, but, you know, I just think um, science will solve the problems. I think science should help us to discover better tools and models to be able to predict what happens to patients and therefore be able to try to design trials that increasingly get better with newer agents to be able to get the maximal impact. And I think um, even though these sound like very tough problems, I think all of these can be engineered if we can sort of um, get the resources to put into it. So. Yeah, that last thing is what I was thinking about is that I, I think that's the the part I failed to appreciate early on was that I think there with these new capabilities comes urgency in that now you you know there's probably something that's not five years down the road, but if you could figure it out faster how to use it well today, right, with science enabling that, um, that, that could make a huge difference now, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe I have two, two follow-ups on, on that theme. So the one is an admittedly hard one. So... Uh, what is, I, I love this analogy of the penicillin discovery. So I, I'm going to pull on that for a second. So um, if you were to imagine like lessons learned from this particular insight, what is the next plate of bacteria waiting for a spore to fall onto it? What wow. is the next, what is the next sort of, and this is, a, I know, hard, but like, can you maybe just even stepping back, uh, provide a little bit of the, the personal perspective on how, you know, there is that reflective moment that, that gives you the the space to notice like this might be a way to to turn a um um a, a medical problem into a medical solution well i'll just um uh, you know my old mentor actually if you can imagine this studied high blood pressure and he always thought that if you study the people at the extremes with really high blood pressure and really low blood pressure to sort of understand this and you know this kind of theme of being able to study uh, human outliers that enable you to understand the fundamental things have always been important and actually been an underappreciated critical part of, you know, um, drug development. So it turns out that, you know, uh, families with cholesterol problems let, probably led to the discovery of the machinery that was eventually targeted with statins. And this happens over and over again. So I guess my thought is that um, if I knew the answer to that, we would be doing that already, which maybe yeah. we are not. But I would say is I still think one of the keys is to really understand with better granularity why people respond differently. And if we can understand that better, we can really understand what holes we're really trying to solve. You know, uh, it's really amazing these days. We have these cohorts of thousands and thousands of patients with human data, but it turns out that a lot of the experiments are done with just cohorts of six mice each kind of thing. And it's really hard to capture that complexity. But I think with advances of technology, machine learning, et cetera, this will become easier and easier to go. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I was thinking about this when you mentioned the uh, gigabytes or terabytes, I guess, uh, of data that you have from the type of characterizations uh, that your group is focusing on. Uh, I'm wondering if you have a thoughts on sort of what what helps, what would help us explore that diversity or that ex, uh, say extremes in human uh, data that we know exist from you know existing observations. What are the things that maybe uh, we need in order to make better use? of the natural variation we have as a species to identify those. And I guess I'm just thinking, are these kind of just, you know, the number of studies that can focus on these are, are limited for some reason? Is there a technological need or a sort of like study design from a policy standpoint? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think it's actually mostly resources, to be honest with you. I think that, you know, um, not to say that we should put all our resources into something. Sometimes you need to put resources in when the technology becomes scalable and you know that part of that is cost scalability. But I do think that we're we're getting to the very close where we can almost do anything. And you know, our ability to take um, simultaneous measurements is so high. Our ability to use machine learning to find, you know, needles in the haystack that explain the whole phenomena is so high. 
I think actually it's probably actually going to be an uh, idea of resources and when we're going to put together the right resources to tackle the right problems. And I think this is a pretty important thing. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. I have one more resource question. So this is um, maybe I'll contextualize why, why I'm asking this before starting. So one of the things that, I, that I've come to appreciate is the idea that we have sort of as a society, a few different ways of trying to help things get from the uh, fundamental research stage all the way into a uh, drug that benefits patients, right? And the tools we use to support that transition, they shape not just whether it can happen, but they shape what applications we go after. They shape the um, ultimate nature of the uh, medicine that comes out of this. And so, you know, I guess, I think you know what I'm referring to, but I'll, I'll just say it for the sake of priming the question here. You know, we if we use federal funds, we can do things at the academic scale and we can do maybe in partnership with um, industry, some aspects of this. And then there's a, you know, uh, scope and alignment that comes with that that determines how to get past that huge chasm between it looks pretty good in a preclinical animal study and it's safe enough that someone with existing resources will bet on it, right? And then the converse is if it's risky enough, but it potentially is transformative, there may be like a, a private capital slash commercial of some other sort way of bringing that out there. And certainly then to survive, that shapes the way that application is picked and the way it's pursued. So what I'm getting at is on your slide at the end of your deck, um, it seems like your research has been um, funded. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, scale, whatever. It seems like you you, you did a um, nice job of highlighting, I think, the portfolio of support that helped you to get here today. And I, I was wondering, I mean, it's, a lot of those seem like they were in the philanthropy kind of foundation landscape, which is, of course, oftentimes the, the, the part that fills the gap between the, um, the federal sources and the private um, investment models here. Can you help us to understand how that played a role in the work you did or just in general for, for those of us who um, maybe are interested, how do you think about the unique ways those different support mechanisms can make a big dent in the uh, agendas you're seeking to uh, pursue? So this is very important. So, you know, um, what I'll say is, as we know, most of research in this country is actually funded by the government. And the government actually um, wants to be very efficient with their money and for a lot of reasons that I won't get into, they really try to do things that are most uh, likely to work. I think it's really a key part of the review process, and they really want things that are going to work. And in you know, if you zoom out, that sounds great. Let's really fund things that are going to work. But if if I put it a different way, you know, in general, things that work are what we call incremental, like maybe a small step forward, small step forward, because it's really hard to find where these leaps are going to happen with things that you know are going to work. And so if I put it out to the, you know, to you, to me, to the group or to anywhere else it would be like, do you think that curing cancer will take small, you know, highly likely to work incremental steps forward, or will it take big, bold endeavors that are risky and likely to have a chance of failing, but also have a chance of succeeding in a major way? And so what I'll say is that, you know, the federal government thinks part of its mission is to use the money wisely and really fund things that are going to work. Once things that are very, get to a stage where it's just very incremental, small steps forward, they're really good at helping to support those things. But, you know, where philanthropy comes in and some of these foundations, but also philanthropy through the university and medical school, is they really want to fund, you know, big ideas that have a risk of failing. And I can just tell you that a lot of the work we've done today was actually founded, it was funded by a few people, many of whom debated whether our strategy was going to work or not. And they had no idea, um, but they thought that our group was the right group. And they thought that our science was well-founded, it was worth the risk. And it's actually turned out better than anyone expected, us or them. And I'll say is that those kind of um, approaches will be almost impossible to you know, push forward in a risk-averse government setting. I think we need to have, you know, um, groups like philanthropy and donors who want to think broadly about let's take some aggressive swipes at trying to cure cancer. And these kind of bold endeavors will really be absolutely critical, I think, for achieving the final mission. Um, 
So again, every lab will be funded by multiple sources. It may be public, it may be private, but I don't think that very many people can take huge risks if they're only using government money. I think that the, the philanthropy will really drive the sometimes expensive, but high risk, high reward approaches that I think will be the key to actually solving complex diseases like cancer. That sounds really compelling. Um, maybe the last, the last. I know there's time for for just one last question. So maybe I'll just ask this. Um, I see, I see the note we're running just about at the time of our of our time today. Um, I'd like to take your answer to that last question and sort of like maybe bring it back to the patient. So when you think about, I mean, what I heard in in your answer was that there's kind of this very special enabling uh, role that resources play. We've talked about it several times throughout the the talk today. Well, um, you mentioned like this need for high risk, high reward here. Um, what is the what is the outcome for patients? Like if you imagine projecting that forward into a consequence in a world where we have that uniquely enabling piece versus we don't have that uniquely enabling piece, what happens differently um, beyond uh, maybe one particular um, story? So what I'll say is that um, we're probably still at the time where if you um, contribute to something, if you donate something, even your tissue, your blood or money, probably it's going to most likely help um, someone else, actually. Like, you know, just the way the drug development way it goes in science, the delays, it just takes a little bit of time. But that period is narrowing so much. And and it would not be. Um, there are people who are already doing this, but I, I won't say it's it's, you know, um, wise or likely to happen but there's going to come a time where very soon where you're going to be able to say i really want to support you know cancer research against cancer x and then we could develop a treatment that could affect someone that you know with the disease uh, very quickly and so i will say is that you know this is not really easily doable now in the matter of months or a year but i think that this is kind of thing that really will take time but take shorter and shorter time so i think that the impact of how this philanthropy goes in a way that affects patient care will get greater and greater as we go through this curve. That's what I heard from your earlier answer too, Ajay, was that like, if, if you imagine we're talking about what does it take to make not just a steady progress, but a leap in what we can do, then that's when you position us to be able to, to take advantage of these other efficiencies coming out of other parts of technology, right? Bringing it from from this big advance into a, into a patient. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to respect the time set aside for our seminar today. So um, maybe I will, I, I'm the only one who will, but everyone in spirit will be clapping for you, Ajay, as well. That was a really fascinating presentation and conversation here. Um, I'll, I'll hand it over to Ashley here then. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Choi and Dr. Leonard for speaking with us. We will be sharing a recording of today's event by email, which will also include my contact information if you're interested in supporting Dr. Chase Choi's lab or learning more about Dr. Choi's research. Uh, thank you again for participating and we hope to connect with you soon. Thank you, Ashley. Take care. Thanks.